I'm getting Kevin his ice cream. <laughs> why, why don't you all stand for a moment and uh, smile at each other or give somebody a pretty shot some massage? <laughs>
find it, or do you just switch on the light? The simplest way, instead of rebuking the darkness and casting it out and binding it in the name of Jesus, is just switch on the light. So that's what we want to do with our people. Switch on the light so that uh, we are attacking a problem and not necessarily a person. We've got to be Christ-like in some of the extremes today. And I think that's uh, uh, one of the things. You might like to make a note of a, note of a couple of thoughts. Uh, I got this off David many, many years ago when we were doing key knowledge seminar. A false balance is an abomination, Lord, but a just weight is his delight. And you find that in... Uh, uh, Jewish custom that they had actually three sets of weights. They had heavy weights, and that was to uh, when they were selling somebody something down to the seller or the buyer, uh, they had heavy weights, and so they cheat them. And then they had light weights, and so when they were buying something in, they'd use the light weights and get more for what they were buying. And then they would have uh, sanctuary weights which was the standard of the sanctuary, the uh, weights of the Lord. And so today, you know, we're living in a time of extreme. Uh, let me just catch you out a little bit because I'm talking to a very intelligent bunch of people this morning. Amen. <laughs> Thank you for the underwhelming response back there. The rest of you, talking to an intelligent bunch of people. Amen. Okay, now, um, I, I haven't got time because I don't want to do that. But I, I use this pair of scales as a, just an illustration of balance. A, just, a false balance is an abomination of the Lord, but a just way to see his delight. And you see, every truth that God brings to the church, the danger is in our human nature, we go to extremes. And so how many believe here uh, that there's only one true God? Hands up. Thank you. Are some of you at the back there? No hand? Okay? Alright. So the Bible tells us that there's only one true God. And so if you put all the scriptures on the on the scales on the oneness of God, you end up in heresy, uh, you know, on uh, Jesus only, as it's referred to, or Unitarianism, or uh, uh, everything like that. But the Bible also tells us that God is three. Is that right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Uh, the right people here? Okay, so God is three, God is one. If you get into threeness and you overemphasize the threeness of God, then you can get into uh, the tritheism. And in my wandering around days when I was younger, uh, I went to a church, I won't say where out of courtesy, and uh, they would wor worship the Father first of all, and after they thought the Father had had enough, then they would <laughs> worship the Son. And after they thought the Son had had enough, they worshipped the Holy Spirit. So they went away, uh, you know. So when you get to heaven, how many gods do, do you expect to see? Do you think you're going to see God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit sitting on three uh, thrones, having a fight? <laughs> so we're all equal. You don't know what you believe, do you? <laughs> okay, let me tell you just one little thought here, because I'm not on theology. The only way we'll ever see God is through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because the Bible tells us in 1 Timothy somewhere that God is light and he dwells in unapproachable light whom no man has seen nor can see. So if you're looking for God, blazing unapproachable light, God is light. He doesn't have light, he is light. And he dwells in unapproachable light whom no man has seen nor can see. So what are you going to see? So the only way we'll ever see God is through our Lord Jesus Christ. Can you say amen on that? Amen. So balance, balance, balance. And uh, just a couple of other illustrations here. Uh, how many believe that Jesus Christ is God? Amen. How many have a got a hand here? <laughs> how many are trying to get caught? Okay, okay. Jesus Christ is God. Amen. But have we believed that Jesus is also man? Yes. So he's not God and man, he's the God man. But you see, if you put all the scriptures on the humanity of Christ, you, de you uh, destroy or nullify his divinity, or if you put all the scriptures on the other side of the scales, you just get out of balance and uh, you destroy his humanity. Now what have false cults in prison have done? 
that overemphasize his humanity and nullify his divinity. We just got to keep balance, balance. Okay. Now, why do I say all that? Um, oh, let me give you one more here, just while I'm having a bit of fun. Uh, how many believe that Calvary is a revelation of the love of God? You're a bunch of chickens here. <laughs> uh, I ask you a question, put your hand up. Uh, you know, I'll see this one. <laughs> okay. All right. How do you believe that Calvary is a revelation of the holiness of God? Let me see, did Brother put his hand up before I even ask the question? <laughs> okay, so, so uh, what is Calvary a revelation? Is it the revelation of the love of God or the holiness of God? Well, which comes first? And he would say holiness. He's still a bunch of chickens out there. The answer is holiness. Because Jesus is dying there for our sin. And when sin has been dealt with, then God can commend his love toward us. But people say in Australia, oh, well, God's love, God's too kind to punish anybody. Uh, let me say while I'm just uh, indulging here. How many believe that this is a good balanced statement? God loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. How many think that's a good balanced statement? Because <laughs> Mr. Australian, when they hear that, oh, God loves the sinner, he, lo he doesn't like the sin, he likes me, he doesn't like what I'm doing. But she'll be right, mate. No. Here's sound theology. God loves the sinner, he hates the sin, but unless the sinner repents of his sin, he's lost. Yes. That's balance. And see, a lot of imbalanced theology comes from the church. And that's why, as leaders, we need to balance out what we're preaching and teaching. So I said all that to say this. Today, we're seeing a whole wave, and uh, because of an old man, but uh, we're seeing a, a fresh wave of, oh, I'm not under law, I'm under grace. And so once in grace, always in grace, even if you're living this grace. <laughs> and I say, that's greasy grace, it'll slide you right to hell. But, uh, let, let's turn uh, over. Uh, uh, press the button when you're ready. Uh, turn over to Jude, just before the book of Revelation. And uh, this is one of the things that concerns me, as I uh, mentioned, uh, uh, Jude verse uh, 3 or 4, I think it is. Okay, let's, uh, let's go from verse uh, 3, Jude verse 3 and 4. And it says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, that's a salvation that is common to us all, not common in a bad sense or negative sense, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once and once and for all delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, and that, note the next expression here, the clause, turning the grace of God into the seriousness, or twisting the grace of God. And that's why I call it greasy grace, turning the grace of God, twisting the grace of God into the seriousness, which simply means all kinds of lusts and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So. Uh, many, many years ago, there was a, uh, a visitation of the Holy Spirit in, in Canada. They saw, of course, Saskatchewan. And um, some of them got into what I called, and this is where I uh, called this nasty expression, uh, greasy grace. And uh, what did they do? They took Paul's doctrine of grace and abused it. So abusing the grace of God, twisting the grace of God. And so they grabbed Romans uh, chapter 6, the last verse or so, verse 21, I think it is, uh, where sin abounds, grace is much more abound. So the more we sin, the more grace will abound. And I'm sorry, I mean, I was a young man of 24 years of age then, and it took me months to recover from it. Uh, I'll just mention that in a moment. And, uh, and so they would preach the gospel, people would get saved and healed and filled with the Spirit, everything like that. But behind the scenes, 
They were in these dens of iniquity, smoking, drinking, fornicating, homosexual, you name it. And they said, where sin abounds, grace is much more abound. So the more we sin, the more we experience the grace of God. They need to read the next verse. Shall we sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Certainly not. Uh, everyone said amen on that. Amen. So it's abusing the grace of God. Now, one of the uh, sad things that I've had to deal with recently, um, how many have read the book that's floating around uh, on uh, Death and to Rain? Heads up. You need to read the book, first of all. You need to read the book. I've, I've just done a 21-page evaluation on this, and uh, I've given the it's only to those who have read the book. If you haven't read the book, you don't get the evaluation. Thank you, Kevin. Smile. Okay. So, 21 pages I did on evaluating. And my son would not allow the book in our bookshop. Uh, it closed it and now. Not because of that. I bought it and uh, we listened to the person involved. And uh, we have them on TV every week in Australia and uh, did this evaluation. I read the book twice. A number of our people were caught up in it. And uh, one of the sad things I've just had to deal with recently, a, a, a brother, a uh, sister in, in Singapore, got into immorality. And, uh, and because somebody, and this is a tough thing uh, that we've got to deal with, we're dealing with mixture. If everything was just straight out falsity, that would be different. But when you've got a mixture of statements and things, and chapters, and yeah, that's very good, I agree with that. Next chapter, uh-oh. And uh, just faulty uh, theology and faulty hermeneutics. In fact, where I'm coming from at my age uh, and my time of life is, I believe that the most important, or two, two most important subjects for us is sound theology, can you say amen on that? Amen. Sound theology and, and also sound hermeneutics. So principles and interpreting the word. So I like them, uh, hermeneutics and theology like to a coin. Every coin has two sides and your theology affects your hermeneutics, your hermeneutics affects your theology. So just to keep balance and see when you're dealing in an age of mixture, and that's what the parables of the kingdom are all about, mixture. Mixture five of the parables out of seven and mixture in it. Wheat and tears, good and bad fish, the woman and the leather, dirty birds up in the tree. Uh, there was just mixture, and that's what we're up against. So sound theology and sound hermeneutics, we all need as leaders and preachers and teachers. Everybody said amen on that? Amen. Okay, so, yeah, so the sad part was that this person took one of the statements and says, even when we sin, we are sinning in the light. That is a false statement. That's not true. And another false statement we've got to deal with, and it depends how you handle it, that Jesus died for all our sins, all our past sins, all our present sins, all our future sins that have already been forgiven. We do not need to ask for forgiveness. That is false doctrine. See? So another thing that's arisen out of that, Faulty theology leads to faulty hermeneutics, or the other way around. And so, one of the uh, hermeneutics that's floating around today is, anything that Jesus spoke before the cross is nothing to do with the church. That is faulty hermeneutics. And that leads to faulty teaching and everything, see? So, okay, I say, well, if that's true, out with the Sermon on the Mount, out with the parables of the kingdom, out with all the teaching of Jesus, once you get into that. And see, so just to keep a balance on these things, as I said, the hardest thing to deal with is the mixture today. And uh, so, as I saw years ago in America, and it took me six months to recover from that, how could God use the people with the gifts of the Spirit and get behind the scene they were in the, what they call, dens of iniquity? Well, six months it took me to recover from that because I was a young man. But you see, here's the thing, if you, if you have, don't already realize it, gifts of the Spirit are no evidence of holiness. You can have character or charisma, but you can have charisma without character. So gifts of the Spirit are no evidence of holiness, and that was tough. 
Okay, so just the balance and balance, and so as I was saying, the case I just had to deal with was a uh, little sad. This woman got into adultery with somebody else. Her husband was going to be divorce her uh, in Singapore, sorry to say. And the, the, the tragedy, tragedy is, even when we sin, we are sitting in the light, and the man jumped out of an eight-story building and committed suicide. So what I'm saying is, what is the fruit of any doctrine? And what I'm talking about today, is it a grace that leads to holiness of living? That's the issue. Is it a grace that leads to holiness of living, or is it an abuse of the grace of God? All right, I'm, I'm going to quit there, but I want you to look at one more scripture with me. And uh, some of you, I see, have already got the, uh, uh, the textbook I've written, uh, written on. Uh, what do you mean? I'm not on the law, I'm on the grace. No. Uh, turn to Titus chapter 2. And probably this is uh, one of the clearest scriptures on it. So, for grace abuses, and we're seeing this in uh, grace abuses, and an another one has been used. So, Titus chapter 2, I'll talk while you're turning there, is that, uh, you know, that when, when John wrote to the to the, 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 the church there, he's writing to Gnostics, he's writing to Jews. And so they say, and we've had to deal with this in our own fellowship, that, all right, John is writing to the Jews or to the Gnostics, and so Christians, as Christians, we do not to say, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and he cleanses from all unrighteousness. But that was spoken to the Gnostics or to the unbelieving Jews. That's not true. Nine times in the epistle, John says, I write unto you little children, I write unto you little children, I write unto you fathers, I write unto you young men. He's writing to believers. So anything else is an abuse of the grace of God. So is grace lawlessness? No, I'm not under law, I'm under grace. Well, what do you mean? Is grace lawlessness? No. Okay, I'd like to encourage you, unless you've already done this, turn to Titus chapter 2, and I just want to give you an outline of a sermon that I'll, I'll probably be sharing uh, this, this week sometime before I go back to my darling wife. Okay, let's go to uh, Titus chapter 2 and verse 11, and because I'm talking to intelligent people, very good response here, sick over here, very sick at the back. Okay, listen carefully to the language because I'm a fanatic, I believe the words are inspired by the Holy Spirit, they're not there to fill up the book, and I really get agitated with some preachers who say, oh the words are peripheral, they're just there to fill up the book, I don't believe that. Okay, verse 11, for the grace of God... Everybody say grace of God? Grace of God. Okay, the grace of God. So we're talking about grace here. The grace of God, and I appreciate the grace of God. You know, definition, the grace of God, the undeserved, unmerited, unearned favor of God bestowed on sinful man. We don't earn it, we don't deserve it, we can't merit it. So the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. So when did the grace of God appear? If you want to put the scripture down, John 1.17. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth, I'll be dealing with that uh, probably tomorrow night, not grace without truth. If you have grace without truth, you get into license, greasy grace as I call it, or you have truth without grace, then you get into uh, legalism and Phariseeism, Galatianism. So grace and truth. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth, not grace without truth. I'll deal with that more fully tomorrow. So let's, let's read again. So verse 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. So when did it appear? The first coming of Jesus. And while I go to verse 13, and I'm reading from old King James here, you note the word, the word appearing, and in verse 11 we have the first coming, the first appearing, and then in verse 13 we have the second coming, the second appearing. So just connect verse 11 and 13 for the moment. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Then verse 13, looking for that blessed hope. 
How many are looking for the blessed hope? Yeah. How many would like to see the uptaker and not the under undertaker? <laughs> Especially the price of funerals. It's two years to die, two years to live. Let's go up uh, when you finish your job. Okay, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. So verse 11 is the first appearing, first coming. Verse 13, second coming, second appearing. Okay, now, notice, and uh, if you mark your Bible, I'd, I'd encourage you to mark this. The grace of God that, uh, that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that. Okay, what does the grace of God teach us? So any grace preacher that I hear preaching, I say, okay, what sort of grace preaching are you taking? If you want to put down... Uh, first, uh, first Peter chapter five verse twelve. Uh, first Peter chapter five verse twelve speaks about the true grace of God. The true grace of God. There's a false grace, greasy grace, as I've called it, and there's a true grace. So, First Peter chapter five verse uh, twelve talks about the true grace. Okay. So, what does the grace of God teach us? I want to just give you an outline here of nine things. And this will teach you, if, if you're a preacher of the grace of God, and we praise God for His grace, we're all here by His grace, I'd like you to put down nine things you develop, but I'm not going to do it for you, otherwise you'll want a refund yeah. on the kind of offering you did. You didn't need to do that, by the way. So, teaching us, the grace of God that bringeth salvation and the to all men, teaching us that, all right, what does the grace of God teach us? So I test everybody who's preaching on grace, is your grace teaching, grace of God teaching and says. Number one, deny, un uh, deny ungodliness. Number one, anything that's not like God, you can develop this yourself. Number two, and worldly lusts. Any desires that are sinful, love not the world or things of the world, you can supply other scripture. I'm just giving you an outline here. So teaching us, the grace of God teaches us, number one, denying ungodliness. Number two, worldly lust. Number three, that we should live soberly. The opposite to soberness is drunkenness. And it really, the, the word sober there, you, you explore this yourself. It means to live of a disciplined mind. We're living in an undisciplined generation. Number four, righteously. Living right, because we are right. And number five, godly, in this present age. So this is what the grace of God teaches us. Uh, and then number, number six, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. We live our life in time, in the light of eternity and the, and the judgment or the beamer seat of Christ. Number four, number six, number seven, who gave himself for us, what? that he might redeem us from all iniquity. So don't go around, I'm not under law, I'm under grace. What do you mean, I'm not under law? Is grace lawlessness? So, redeem us from all lawlessness, iniquity. And number eight, where we're up to, uh, or seven, redeem us, for, yeah, redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. So he that hath this hope in himself purifies himself. So purify unto himself the peculiar people. And then number nine, zealous of good works. And the people uh, extremes on that are going out of balance. Well, we're saved by grace through faith and not by works. No, Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So this is what the grace of God teaches. So you can measure me or measure anybody or your preacher or teacher or whatever. Okay, what sort of grace of God are you teaching? The grace of God teaches us that. How many think that's a good sermon outline there? So nine qualities of true grace of God preaching. Okay, let me give you a couple of other verses that are flashed in my mind. I said that was the last one, but uh, you can press the button in a minute. Uh, turn to First Corinthians chapter 9. And, and it's, you know, the more I've studied this over the years and seen the abuses back there in the, uh, the 1950s, 60s, yeah, well, and then again today. Uh, go to verse, uh, verse 19, 1 Corinthians 9. 
Would I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain them all? And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews, and to them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law, to them, and it's very important to read this properly, verse 21, to them that are without law, as without law, and then in parenthesis, so Paul didn't feel that he was being charged with lawlessness, greasy grace, he said, being not without law to God, and everybody said the next few uh, sentences would be the next sentence, but under the law to Christ. I'm not lawless. I appreciate the grace of God, but grace is not lawlessness. I'm under the law to Christ. And the law to Christ is love, the law of love. Love is the fulfilling of the law. So being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. And uh, let me turn to one more scripture, and I'll make this the really, really last one. Uh, Romans chapter 13. So I, I, I think a lot of the problem today is people don't understand law, reaction, reacting against legalism or extreme, and so it's got into radical grace. Okay, um, Romans chapter 13, my last scripture. Verse 8. So I would recommend that you do a study on law and grace. Uh, keep the balance out there. Grace is not lawlessness. So in verse 8 he says, Owe no man anything but to love one another. Everybody say, Love one another. Yeah. For he that loveth another has fulfilled the law. Love and law. For this, thou should not commit adultery. Oh, where did you get that from, Paul? Oh. Ten Commandments, Kevin, go back, Exodus, Exodus 20, and read it. Thou shalt not kill. Where would you get that from, Paul? Oh, Exodus 20. Thou shalt not steal. Where would you get that from? Thou shalt not bear false witness. Where would you get that from? Thou shalt not covet. Oh, where would you get all those commandments from? I thought I'm not under law. Uh, let me ask you this question. How many believe that the Ten Commandments were nailed to the cross? Hands up. Still a bunch of shit. <laughs> uh, I'll uh, have to say this as I finish reading. All Ten Commandments are repeated in the New Testament by Jesus and the Apostles except the Fourth Commandment on the Sabbath. And so what's the greatest promise, contrary to some of the writings that are out today, the greatest promise of the new covenant that Jeremiah said, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I'm going to make a new covenant. Now, he's under the old covenant, he's under the Mosaic covenant, but he's prophesying the days are coming, says the Lord, I'm going to make a new covenant. And uh, one of the great promises, you know, I'll forgive their sins and iniquities and everything, wonderful promises, but a great promise is I'm going to write my laws into their minds and into their hearts. Grace is not lawlessness. So instead of Ten Commandments on two tons of stone, telling me what to do, giving me no power to do it, and condemning me for not doing it, the New Covenant writes His law in our minds and in our hearts. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, He gives us grace to do it. Everyone say amen. amen. And let's continue the verse there. Verse uh, uh, 13. No, verse, yeah, verse 9. And if there be any other commandment, it's briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself. Love works no ill to his neighbor, therefore love, and you need to, you know, we've got such a reaction, oh, I hate the law, oh, how I love thy law. No, love is the fulfilling of the law. It's the law of love. I love my wife. She loves me. I think she does. Yes. <laughs> Better for worse for Bishop Paul. And so when I leave to come up here, I didn't give my wife ten commandments. Thou should have no other husband beside you. <laughs> Thou should not run around taking photos of other men <laughs> to compare them with me. I didn't give her ten commandments. Because we have a love relationship. 
and love of this book better than the Lord. I give the credit for the squeeze that he has my credit cards and things like that. And then she says, we have signs and wonders. I sign. <laughs>